Welcome back to Domain 1 of 5th grade. We're doing Lesson 12 today, which is Sensory Descriptions and Context Clues. Our objectives for today is we're going to write a paragraph using multiple sensory descriptions. Based on the context, you're going to determine the meaning of an unknown word and phrase in a text, and we're going to continue writing our surprise narratives. Some key vocabulary for today's lesson. The right stuff a 1983 movie about the first seven American astronauts. John Glenn, one of the seven American astronauts, first seven American astronauts. Rekindled, reawakened, brought to life again. Graduate school, a school for post-college study. MIT, a university in Massachusetts famous for teaching science and engineering. NASA, the United States agency that oversees the space program. Space shuttle, a type of spacecraft used by NASA from 1981 to 2011. Hubble Space uh, Space Telescope, a space telescope that orbits the Earth. A spectrograph, a type of camera attached to the Hubble Space Telescope. Capability, power or ability. Expense, cost. Airlock, a chamber astronauts must pass through when entering or exiting a spacecraft. Momentum, a force of movement. And tether, a cord fastening something or someone to a base. So we're going to read an excerpt, um, a few pages from A View of the Earth. In 1984, I was a senior in college, and I went to see the movie The Right Stuff. And a couple of things really st struck me in that movie. The first was the view out the window of John Glenn's spaceship, the view of the Earth, how beautiful it was on the big screen. I wanted to see that view. And secondly, the camaraderie between the original seven astronauts depicted in that movie. How they were good friends, how they stuck up for each other, how they would never let each other down and wanted to be a part of an organization like that. And it rekindled a boyhood dream that had gone dormant over the years. That dream was to grow up to be an astronaut. And I just could not ignore this dream. I had to pursue it. So I decided I wanted to go to graduate school and I was lucky enough to get accepted to MIT. While I was at MIT, I started applying to NASA to become an astronaut. I filled out my application and I received a letter that said they weren't quite interested. So I waited a couple of years and I sent in another application. They sent me back pretty much the same letter. So I applied the third time and this time I got an interview. So they got to know who I was and then they told me no. So I applied a fourth time. And on April 22nd, 1996, I knew the call was coming, good or bad. I picked up the phone and it was Dave Lee Lisma, the head of flight crew operations at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. He said, hey Mike, this is Dave Lisma. How are you doing this morning? And I said, I really don't know, Dave. You're going to have to tell me. And he said, well, I think you're going to be pretty good after this phone call because we want to make you an astronaut. Thirteen years after that, it's May 17, 2009, and I'm on Space Shuttle Atlantis, about to go and do a spacewalk on the Hubble Space Telescope. And our task that day was to repair an instrument that had failed. This instrument was used by scientists to detect the atmospheres of far-off planets. Planets in the other solar systems could be analyzed using the spectrograph to see if we might have find a planet that was Earth-like or a planet that could support life. And just when they got good at doing this, the power supply on this instrument failed. It blew. So the instrument could no longer be used. And there was no way really to replace this unit to repair the instrument. Because when they launched this thing and they got it ready for space flight, they really buttoned it up. They didn't want anybody to screw with this thing. It was buttoned up with the access panel that blocked the power supply that had failed. This access panel had 117 small screws with washers, and just to play it safe, they put glue on the screw threads so they would never come apart. You know, it could withstand a space launch, and there was no way we could get to fix this thing. But we really want the Hubble's cap capability back, so we started working. And for five years, we designed a spacewalk. We designed over 100 new space tools to be used. A great taxpayer's expense, at great taxpayer's expense, millions of dollars, thousands of people worked on this. And my buddy, Mike Good, who we call Bueno, he and I were going to go out to do this spacewalk. I was going to be the guy actually doing the repair. And inside was Drew Fustel, one of my best friends. He was going to read me the checklist, and we had, we had practiced for years and years for this. They built us our own practice instrument and gave us our own set of tools so we could practice in our office, in our free time, during lunch, after work, 
on the weekends. We became like one mind. He would say it, I would do it. We had our own language, and now was the day to go out and do this task. The thing I was most worried about when we when leaving the airlock that day was the path to get the telescope, because it was along the side of the space shuttle. And if you look over the edge of the space shuttle, it's like looking over a cliff, with 350 miles down, miles to go down to the planet, and there are no good handrails. When we're spacewalking, we like to grab onto things with our space gloves and be nice and steady. But I got this one area along the side of the shuttle, and there was not a good, nothing good to grab. I had to grab a wire or a hose or a knob or a screw, and I'm kind of a big goon. But when there's gravity, you can get a lot of momentum built up, and I could go spinning off into space. I knew I had a safety tether that would probably hold, but I also had a heart that I wasn't sure about. I knew they would get me back, and I wasn't sure when the, what they would get me back on the end of the tether when they reeled me in. So I was really concerned about this. I took my time, and I got through the treacherous path and out to the telescope. The first thing I had to do was to remove the handrail from the telescope, and that was blocking the access panel. There were two screws on, on the top. They came off easily, but there was one screw on the bottom right, and that came out easily. The fourth screw is not moving. My tool is moving, but the screw is not. I look close and it's stripped, and I realize that the handrail is not coming off, which means I can't get to the access panel with its 117 screws that I've been worrying about for five years, which means I can't get to the power supply that failed, which means we're not going to be able to fix this instrument today, which means all these smart scientists can't find life on other planets, and I'm to blame for this. And I could see what they would be saying in science books of the future. This is, was going to be my legacy. My children and my grandchildren would read in their classmate, classrooms. We would we would know if there was life on other planets, but Gabby and Daniel's dad, my children would suffer from this. Gabby and Daniel's dad broke the Hubble Space Telescope and we'll never know. So if we, as we were reading this, there was a couple of words in there that were um, pretty unfamiliar um, that I wanted to kind of touch on um, that we could use our contact clues in order to determine. So one of those words was camaraderie. So the sentence was a second, and secondly, the camaraderie between the original seven astronauts depicted in the movie. Well, when you see that word, it's kind of long and it's not really easy to understand. But if you continue with the sentence, you can kind of figure out what camaraderie means. How they were good friends, how they stuck together, they never let each other down. That's what camaraderie is, that, that friendship. Um, so that's what, how we use our context clues to determine unknown words that are not really familiar to us. Um, another word that I noticed was dormant. Um, when something is dormant, it doesn't really go anywhere. So if it's rekindling and re-sparking this dormant thing, it means that he wants to continue on with this dream. So when we're looking at context clues, you can continue reading that sentence. Sometimes it's around it. Um, and you can use those clues and decode it in your brain and figuring out what those unfamiliar words mean. So now what you're going to do is you're going to continue on with your surprise narrative. You're going to uh, submit that to your teacher and uh, you can continue working on the same one you've been working on or you can make a new one, um, however you'd like to do that. Um, just when you are finished with it, be sure to send it to your teacher. And I will see you all in our next lesson.